Next on the list is frontotemporal dementia, which is a gradual progressive dementia affecting the frontal and the temporal lobe, so it primarily affects behavior and language before it affects memory. It's an early onset disorder that begins between ages 45 and 65. Only 10 to 20 percent may begin after 65 years of age, and the course is usually depending on the clinical subtypes, which I will discuss in the next slide. The epidemiology, so it's about 50,000 to 60,000 cases in the United States, and it depends on the population studies. It could be considered as the most common early presenting dementia, and it could be the second most common early dementia after early onset Alzheimer's disease. So there are several subtypes of the frontotemporal disease or frontotemporal dementia. The most common one is the behavioral variant of frontotemporal disease. The other less common subtypes include the semantic variant of primary progressive aphasia and the non-fluent variant of the primary progressive aphasia. There are other much less common subtypes of frontotemporal disease, including the NFID and the BIBD. So the cause of frontotemporal disease is not exactly known. There is a lot of active research in that area. But as far as we know, there is an accumulation of phosphorylated tau and abnormal toxic proteins that bind the DNA, causing neuronal cell death, most of which are related to genes located on chromosome 17. So 10 to 15% of cases are familial due to defects in that chromosome. One important gene defect that you should know is the trinucleotide repeat expansion of the gene C9ORF72, which is related to a much worse prognosis and outcomes. It also exhibits anticipation phenomena, which means that the disease manifests at a younger age with each subsequent generation, and it's related to showing more psychotic symptoms in these subjects. So as far as we know regarding the neuropathology, it is atopathy with neurofibrillary tangles, and it happens to cause loss of 70% of the spindle neurons in the cortex. These are large cortical neurons, unlike the pyramidal cells that are affected in Alzheimer's disease. So when these neurons are affected in the anterior cingulate cortex, it affects the motivation. If it affects the frontal insular cortex, may affect the social cognition, and if it affects the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, it affects mood, executive function, inhibition, and abstract reasoning. These are the parts of the salience brain network which is responsible for communication, social behavior, and self-awareness. So the diagnosis of the behavioral variant FTD depends on having three or more of the following clinical criteria, which include disinhibition, apathy, loss of sympathy or empathy, perseveration or compulsive behaviors, hyperorality, and executive dysfunction on the neuropsych testing. The MRI may show frontal lobe or frontal lobe with anterior temporal lobe atrophy, but in early cases, the scan may seem absolutely normal. The FTG PET scan classically show hypometabolism in the frontal and the temporal lobes, which can differentiate it from Alzheimer's disease, which classically show parietal and temporal hypometabolism. The language subtypes can be regionally dissociated by imaging approaches. So the non-fluent will be more affecting the frontal side, and the semantic variant will be more affecting the posterior uh, parts of the temporal lobe. The prognosis usually is much rapid than Alzheimer's disease when it comes to progression. Survival is somewhere between 2 to 20 years, and it's particularly worse with a behavioral variant, and they eventually will need 24-7 care. There is no treatment, and the management is pretty similar to the three pillars of Alzheimer's disease management that were mentioned in part one, with periodic review of the evolving and emerging symptoms, cognitive enhancers that could be used for Alzheimer's, 
may actually worsen the clinical presentation in frontotemporal disease, and there is no role for monoclonal therapies at this point.